Thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. I hope the microphone's working. <coughs> Um, well, this is an interesting topic. Uh, I'm a parent. I have three young kids. I have twins who are six. And I, I know there's certain challenges they're going to face as they get older. And I hope as a parent I can help them address that. But what scares me more, like when my nine-year-old wants to listen to a certain kind of music, that sure, I listen to as well. But I was 15 and he's nine, um, so he's starting earlier. There are certain challenges that they are likely to face that I can't really anticipate. So all I hope to be able to do is to teach them to be resilient enough to be able to deal with these challenges, these setbacks, or uh, God forbid something worse that befalls them in the course of their upbringing. So that's sort of how I understand <coughs> the challenge that we're taking on uh, throughout this conference and throughout this panel. And Mike Chertoff, you and I have known each other for a long time, and I've known you as a, a litigator and then Secretary of Homeland Security who deals in this area of terror, uh, huge shocks uh, in, in, in weather, for instance. How do we interpret trying to prevent bad things from happening and then being able to deal with something that happens, some sort of shock? Well, David, I, th I think they're both um, parts of the same spectrum. When we think about security and safety, <clears throat> we generally think about a series of things that you do to try to minimize the negative impact of, a, of a, an adverse event. Obviously, you like to prevent things if you can. You also like to build capabilities to uh, be tougher so that if there is a negative event, its impact is lessened. But a big piece of it is resilience, the ability to respond and to mitigate something. And we see this you know, when we deal with natural disasters. Uh, you're not gonna prevent hurricanes and tornadoes. Uh, you can do some things up front to minimize uh, the impact, but a lot of it is how quickly you're able to respond and how you're able to set up your, uh, the architecture of your society so that a failure in one end can be limited and doesn't cascade across a lot of different parts of, of society. Well, David, pick up on that from a, from a financial market point of view. If somebody wants to bring me another law of mic, by the way, maybe that'll work. Um, describe how you interpret the difference between prevention, you know, a bank has to have enough capital in case something bad happens. We saw how that worked out in 2008. Uh, um, as, as opposed to so preventing bad things as opposed to being resilient. Well, I think um, in some ways, sustainability and resilience are the, the same, same conversations. You can, you can certainly think about what works in markets and what work, works in business. You can anticipate actually or make judgments about what's not working, and I would hope to talk a little bit about that uh, later this morning. Um, and so you, you need to, to have that, that broader perspective. But I think ultimately uh, you need to go back to first principles to figure out how should business operate, how should markets operate, how should um, capital be deployed properly, and what are the, the challenges and issues associated with that. So it, resilience is an important component of it. Uh, there's the broader issues that I think we need to think about. Right, the sustainability being one. But Christiana, let me bring you into this because one aspect of this is everybody says whether, you know, if you invest money in the stock market, you say, well, history tells us over time that things are going to be okay. The problem with history is that it just depends on what has happened and what hasn't, uh, with, with the unforeseen or something that's altogether new, be it in the area of climate change or a financial shock that we had not seen before, that we're in a different realm in terms of taking preventive action or even uh, trying to build up resiliency. So the interpretation then becomes altogether different when you don't know what you're trying to foresee or anticipate. Well, that is the uh, very much the challenge because uh, resilience now needs to be in the context, both for the private sector, both for um, national security, for international security, needs to be in the context of the uncertainty of climate change. So it's almost resilience duplicated, um, a very, very difficult challenge that we have. But you know, I want to make two points because I think very often when we say, okay, we have to put um, a lot of thought and a lot of financing into adaptation, into beginning to help 
communities, societies um, raise their level of resilience, we forget that there is a very, very close link between that, uh, the cost of that adaptation and what we have done previously on bringing emissions down. So the fact is those are not mutually exclusive costs. The fact is, had we done more on controlling our emissions in the past, we wouldn't have the huge cost of adaptation that we do now. And vice versa, if we were able to increase the pace and the scale of mitigation, bringing down emissions now, the cost of future adaptation is going to come down. So those two things are intimately linked. And on resilience, I think what um, the big lesson that we ought to be able to incorporate is from the health sector. It took us many, many years, but I think now the lesson is very well firm into in the health sector practitioners um, that one thing is to cure, but another thing is to prevent. And that prevention of health issues is actually a much better investment than only running to cure. And that's the same thing with adaptation. If the only thing that we're doing on adaptation is running behind the effect of the tornado, the drought, the flood, then we are completely behind. What we really need to begin to think about is how do we build the resilience in order to prevent the worst impacts of these uh, extreme weather events. Let's keep it at the general, Steve Ratner, which is um, in any complex system, and you've dealt with a couple of big ones. Obviously, you're in the, in the financial industry, but it, when you were in the government dealing with another huge sector, which is auto, prevention is hard enough. Preventing bad things, getting people to pay for that, getting governments to organize around it and get the public behind it. <laughs> How do you interpret the idea of this notion of, okay, there's stuff that could happen that we can't totally envision. How do we get ourselves most prepared to absorb that, especially today? Um, well, first of all, I also have twins. Mine are 21, and I can assure you it doesn't get easier. Um, <laughs> uh, but back to your question. Look, I, I think if, let me just look at this a little bit from the government perspective, because I did spend some time there. And what I worry about is, in fact, that government, at least our government, uh, regardless of party uh, orientation, is having a harder and harder time dealing with these kinds of future things that don't have an immediate political payback, may have a financial cost, taking the easy path out. Uh, you mentioned health care. That's certainly an, a good example of where we're not setting ourselves up to be resilient in the future to absorb shocks. We're basically digging ourselves into a hole uh, on health care that is going to simply encumber our ability to respond to other things going forward. And I worry about the resiliency of our government. I saw the other day that uh, this Congress has passed fewer laws than any in 20 years. Now, some people may say that's a good thing. I actually think it's a bad thing. I think there's work for the Congress to do and work for the government to do to prepare ourselves for these kinds of things. And as we all know, it's not getting done. So this is the idea of the general, which is, I think, kind of interpreting what resilience means in today's context. And so what I'd like to do is, is look at some scenarios where resilience becomes important in terms of things that could actually occur, and then maybe get to the point of how various systems have to interact with one another to find some solutions to become more resilient. I think that's in keeping with the thrust of, of um, today's discussions. So let's, let's create a scenario. Mike, I mentioned this to you before we came out. Um, a, some sort of cyber attack that we know is a growing problem. Can you describe a scenario, and everybody can comment on the various uh, cascading effects of such a scenario, uh, to give the audience a realistic look at, at the kind of scenario where resilience would be called for, and then we can talk a little bit about then, then how can systems <clears throat> interact with one another to, to, to mitigate the fallout? So I'll take a, hypo, a hypothetical uh, scenario, not at all predictive, so don't get alarmed. <laughs> but imagine that you had cyber attacks on nuclear plants, and those plants wound up uh, at a minimum going offline and perhaps actually creating a situation where you had uh, what you had in Japan uh, last year. Now, there'd be immediate impact in terms of the plants themselves, the surrounding area, there would be issues about evacuating people, concerns about health. There would also be, um, in some parts of the country, loss of, of uh, generating power. But of course, because everything is interdependent, that would then have impact on the entire grid uh, across the country. You'd feel it in other areas. In those areas that were directly affected, 
you would start to see communications perhaps going down. If you don't have power, you can't power up your cell phone. The lack of communications would cause people to become alarmed. People perhaps couldn't go to the bank and get money out of their ATM. They would start to hoard cash. So as you start to think about all the things that would occur, you, you realize that you would rapidly have an exponentially multiplying crisis uh, in which the psychological element, lack of understanding of what's going to happen, lack of situational awareness, would in many ways be the most difficult problem because people wouldn't know how to manage and adapt. So that's kind of a, 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 a negative but by no means impossible uh, scenario. All right, so there is a shock that occurs. And David, you, you're hearing about this from the vantage point of London and looking at your, your businesses or looking at an entire you know, financial system. What do you begin to see occur and, and the system's ability to absorb that initial shock. Right. Well, in some ways, uh, we've, we've experienced a, a similar uh, event with 9-11. And so what would, would likely happen if, if it were as significant as I think you were, you were describing, which would be terrible, markets would need to shut. And they would need to shut so we could get some sense of, of clarity as, and, and a sense of balance. If you were to leave the markets open, particularly, well, depending on if communication went down, that would be a, a problem. But if you left the markets open, you, you know that there would be significant volatility. Uh, you would probably see uh, significant declines in markets around the world, and there would be panic, for sure. And so in those sorts of situations, the only thing regulators and governments and central bankers can do is, is call a timeout, in, in my judgment. Now, over time, you would need to, to test to see how terrible uh, or not the circumstance was and uh, whether the markets would be closed for a short period of time or a longer period of time would, would need to be a judgment. Now, after saying all of that, the extent that you, you can't close markets permanently that would be a terrible thing too, and you need to to adjust to you'll you would have to have a market reaction. The question is, would it be uh, with more full information or would it be in a panic circumstance? So Christiana, if I widen out the aperture a little bit to say we're talking about a scenario that is a disaster, we can uh, the mode may be a little bit different because of how the disaster comes online. But we still, in our mind, have some frame of reference, 9-11 being the obvious one, of some sort of national disaster. So <coughs> from your point of view, imagine this scenario e either being tripped by something uh, that we haven't dealt with before or having ramifications that we haven't seen before and play that out in your mind. What kind of, uh, A, ability do we have to absorb the shock where is our inability to absorb some of these shocks that need to be, you know, where some attention need be paid? Well, I was, um, I was struck when you were um, describing the scenario because uh, I have a 21-year-old who just before I got on the plane to come here says, Mom, have you read The Hunger Games? And I go, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. She says, you've got to read this. So, of course, I dutifully go pick up the book on the, um, on, at the airport and read the book on my way over here. Uh, and it strikes me that um, we're not very far off from the very, very frightening scenario that is painted in that book where you just don't know what is coming at you. Uh, you're going along, you know you're in a difficult situation. Anyway, we understand the challenges that we have. Uh, right now, but you don't know all of the things that could come uh, that could come to further disrupt. And what is very scary when you put this all into the climate change perspective is that the 9/11 and the scenario that that's been painted here is, to a certain extent, our imagination and our experience um, can deal with it with difficulty and with cost but we have the tools to difficulty uh, to deal with it and we will, we will certainly pay for it. But what happens? What happens now that we're you know, painting scenarios if we move into a scenario where we have such a concentration of greenhouse gases that we're actually beyond the tipping point, that we go beyond the balance? And then we have scenarios that we can't even imagine. That is a very, very scary. Your scenario is one that one could actually imagine. But what would happen if we go into scenarios that we actually can't even imagine 
Well, but um, we were, we've been there. I mean, we've been there recently. I mean, if we 9-11 was a failure of imagination. So Steve, pick up on this point. If you like, you can put it in that context, in a security context, weather, a climate change, or even in the financial sector. I mean, you know, there were so many people in the financial system who said, well, we have all these historical models. We can't imagine housing, you know, having that kind of crisis. Um, what is our ability to even imagine this kind of scenario in, in the financial system after what we've been through? Right. Let me separate it. First say, I think 9-11 is actually a good example of a terrible crisis, a terrible problem, a terrible human tragedy that we were actually able to deal with. That after the market was shut for some days, after we dealt with all the grieving, which obviously went on for a very long time, the economy was in a reasonably shallow recession. There were a lot of resources marshaled, and we worked our way out of it. And it, it, there's still a scar, I think, for every one of us. But the fact is, we did have the resiliency, and we did have the ability to get through that. I think, on the other hand, there are things that you could imagine happening uh, that would be more challenging. And so in my, in my part of the world, um, yeah, you could have some ki another kind of financial crisis like we had, but frankly, even that one is not the worst thing I can imagine. Mm -hmm. The worst thing I could imagine, just to give you an example, would be that one day the markets wake up and say, you know, the United States with its incredibly low uh, borrowing rates, you're really not as good a credit as we thought. You're really, you may not be Greece, may not be even Italy, maybe you're Spain, maybe you're somewhere in that zip code because of all this irresponsible fiscal um, uh, policies we've had. And then suddenly the bond market uh, shuts down on us and the government has to take very drastic action uh, to get our finances in shape. And that would be unbelievably painful. Do I think we could do it? Yeah, I think we could do it. Uh, do I wish we were planning for it? Yeah, I wish we were planning for it. Um, but if it happens, it will be very, very unpleasant. So Mike Chertoff, is government the centerpiece of resiliency? It's not, but uh, I, I think government's a necessary uh, element of it. Look, the best resiliency, I think, comes when you can engage uh, everybody at all levels, including uh, people in their families and in their local communities. You know, I spent a lot of time on dealing both with terrorism, counterterrorism, and natural disasters. And, you know, the most resiliency comes when people are prepared at all levels. We used to tell people, you ought to have uh, food at home for 72 hours. You ought to have a plan for what you would do if there was some kind of a disaster that cut you off from power and, and the ability to go out and, uh, to the supermarket. Um, and to the extent you can train people how to plan and prepare, you get much greater resiliency. The challenge we have both at the individual level and at the government level, certainly in this country, is the difficulty we sometimes have in planning and preparing and investing for contingencies. And I think this is to the point that, that was made earlier. Um, to some degree, investing for things that haven't happened yet does not produce an immediate return. And uh, I hate to say it, but for a lot of people, if it's, there's not a short-term payoff, they're not interested. Uh, the difficulty is that um, it, it, that's a little like playing musical chairs. What you're hoping is the music doesn't stop while you're still in the room. If it does, you're going to have a problem. So part of what government ought to do um, is to take a somewhat longer-term perspective and see how you build incentives and structures that promote planning for contingencies and also, frankly, invest. And can I give you just a little example from real life? In, in 2005, there was a hurricane in Florida called Wilma. Now, Florida is always very well prepared for hurricanes. They had a lot of fuel and other supplies on hand. And even though it was a devastating uh, hurricane, they were prepared to get up and running very quickly. The problem was, in order for people to restart everything, they had to be able to drive to their place of work. And many of the gas stations, while they had ample fuel, did not have the ability to pump the fuel because they didn't have generators. And they, they needed generators because the power plants weren't on, because the people who had to go to start the power plants couldn't get to the power plants because they didn't have gas for the cars. So we said, geez, why don't you guys get generators for the gas stations? And the thing is, a lot of the gas station owners said, well, you know, for us, it's not economic. There's no economic incentive. We can deal with two or three days' loss of revenue rather than paying for a $20,000 generator. The punchline is eventually the state of Florida required, as a licensing um, condition, that gas stations get generators. So that's an example of a, a small investment 
that makes a big difference in terms of resiliency. So the question is, in the financial arena, I mean, the government has gotten into the business of mandating that the financial sector do certain things to prevent um, another calamitous outcome of a shock. Are those things now going to work? Well, I, I, think, but I think what Mike is saying is exactly the point, that, that to have resiliency depends on a whole lot of players, whether it's individuals, private institutions, companies, whatever, but it also depends on the government that at the end of the day, the government, and I say this in the context of a lot of current emotion about maybe there should be less government, government should pull back, government has a role to play when systems fail. And what we saw in 2008 and 2009 in the banks and again in the auto companies were systems, were markets closing, simply markets failing. And it's just like the generator on a much larger scale. If the government hadn't come in with its capital, we would have had a complete market shutdown for no really good reason, except that markets uh, do fail. So the question is, have we addressed it? I think part of government's job is to regulate and is to uh, ensure that private players are acting responsibly. And I would say that in a reasonably cumbersome, clumsy way, Dodd-Frank not being uh, the bill any of us would have designed if we'd had, a, had the chance, but knowing we needed something, I think we have uh, eliminated a lot of the problems but not all of them, and I think the possibility of something else like this happening within our working lifetimes is, is still very real. David, you brought up the point about sustainability being so important, and I asked whether government is the centerpiece. Do you think systems, companies in your area on their own are doing, taking the sort of steps necessary to become more resilient? Well, uh, unfortunately, no, and I was going to uh, add uh, to Steve's point that the, the, the challenge I think we have, uh, uh, government clearly is part of a conversation, is in many ways uh, a, a critical first principle part. Regulation, the ground rules for capitalism are, it's critical that there be some ground rules. And in some ways maybe that's one of the problems with capitalism today is that the ground rules have, have changed and people don't feel comfortable that they're the rules. But within leaving that aside, one of the, the issues that, that I see is that unfortunately we as citizens, we as people in capital markets, we as business professionals are becoming very short term oriented. Now that may be because of technology, that may be because of our natural mindset, but we are making bad economic decisions, we're making bad uh, environmental decisions, we're making bad security decisions because of the short termism and we need to take steps back. If we really want to protect and create resilience, we're going to need to address why we are not willing to buy those generators, why we are going to react in fa uh, financial markets today based on a series of short-term earnings forecasts and, and drive markets based on that, which is actually not economic and not uh, particularly logical from a corporate finance perspective. We need to sort of rethink our our outlook, the politic, political cycle in this country, but not only in this cycle, uh, in this country, is very short-term oriented. It's now minutes or, or seconds in terms of uh, public opinion polls. This is all leading toward to less resilient markets, less resilient business, less resilient government. Well, and Christiana, talk about it from the, the point of view of climate change in a political context, in a in the context where the relationship between the governed and government seems to be changing in a way that makes solving very difficult problems almost historically difficult, uh, particularly taking on the issue that you care so much about. You know, what strikes me is this conversation that we're having here this morning is a conversation um, that is industrialized country centered. We're talking here about the resilience of markets. We're talking about the resilience of the financial system. We're talking about the resilience of our investments. Um, what is underpinning that is how do we protect our comfort? How do we protect our current lifestyle? That is a very different conversation to the conversation that is very urgent and very painful in developing countries about resilience. There it's not about how do we protect our comfort, how do we protect our lifestyle, it's about how do we survive. It's a very different conversation. There we're talking about 42 island states that could well be underwater and lose the ground on which they sleep, the ground on which they produce food. Um, there we're talking about Bangladesh perhaps being 
having to displace 30 million people. Where are those 30 million people going to go? Where is Maldives? We, we know the story of Maldives, right? Maldives is figuring <coughs> out where do we take our people because they're, they're, they're two centimeters above, above sea level. So it's a very different conversation. And when we talk about resilience, we have to really see both sides of this. We can't assume that the only resilience that it is our responsibility to address is our own internal circumscribed to industrialized countries. Our resilience, our responsibility is A, to help improve resilience in developing countries for themselves, but also out of our own self-interest because if they get hit the way that science is predicting they're gonna get hit, ultimately all of those people are gonna be standing knocking on our doors and saying, excuse me, I don't have any place to live or sleep or produce food. Can I please come into your country? Then what do we do? I, it's an important point, I think. Does anybody have any perspective on what the responsibility then of, of the United States, both government, but, but other systems in the United States, what responsibility we have for that kind of shock occurring elsewhere? Well, I, I, would say, I, I would say two things. First, I think we have a responsibility to try to address climate change within our borders in a way that minimizes the chance of this happening or certainly um, uh, diminishes it. And we're, we're not really doing that in any terribly effective way, as everybody here knows. And secondly, I, look, I personally think we have a responsibility to do far more internationally, much more broadly, to help people uh, under all, uh, not only under this scenario, but under so many other scenarios, whether it's famine or other kinds of natural disasters. But as everybody here knows, the political wind is blowing the other way, and we have been consistently cutting the amount of resources that we're prepared to devote to these kinds of issues. And personally, I think that's terrible, but, but that's, where, that's where the political winds have been blowing. But Mike Chertoff, there's another piece of this that Christiana addresses, but I think one question that her, her point still leaves is, if, if any sort of shock, unforeseen shock, tests the resilience of the United States, government or other systems within the United States, that has some sort of crippling effect on the United States, then the ability to address needs uh, in, in other places becomes hampered as well, even if we're not you know, effectively wiped out. Um, so that's a key part of it as well. And climate change, for instance, if, it, if the United States, if the developed world cannot come to some sort of consensus about how to build resi resiliency, then it, it, what's the point of then helping others to do it if, if the biggest actors aren't, aren't leading the way? I mean, you, I, I think you, know, you have to distinguish between two types of, of crises when you talk about resiliency. One is the sudden shock. Um, which may be predictable in a generic sense, but you know, the timing and the exact way in which it plays out is a surprise. And, and then how do you build resiliency to respond to that? The other somewhat uh, challenging in a different way is the slow movement towards something that at some point will tip, but uh, you actually can see it coming. This also happens, by the way, in the area of cyber too, where you see over time a growth in cybersecurity problems, theft of intellectual property, uh, things of that sort. And so we see something coming, but it's a little bit like the story about boiling the frog. It's happening so slowly the frog doesn't jump out of the pot because it doesn't feel that sudden shock. So these are really two different elements. I'd say the fundamental challenge you have, particularly globally, is this. Um, even within the US, where we have a unitary governmental system, uh, there's a tendency for political leadership to put off things that aren't going to yield a, a, an immediate return. And there's a professor at the University of, of Pennsylvania who has coined the phrase NIMTOF, not in my term of office, <laughs> meaning the tendency of most politicians to say, is this going to happen when I'm up for election or is it going to happen after I leave? Add to that the fact that we're now in a world where it's very hard, I think, for the average citizen to understand why major decisions about the way we live are not made by our own political leaders or our own business leaders, but by things that people and leaders do in other parts of the world, of which the perfect example is Greece and maybe Spain. <clears throat> you know, the Europeans are having a crisis now because they are saying to themselves, wait a second, our entire futures depend upon decisions made by the bond market and by, you know, German uh, officials, and yet we're Greeks, we're the cradle of democracy, how does this work? That's a very hard thing for, for people to get their heads around. I wonder at the individual level as well, 
whether there's enough being done by uh, families, you know, at all income and class levels, to prepare for shocks in their own lives. You can think of it in terms of personal savings. You can think of it in terms of developmental issues in people's families. And we've made references to to our kids. You know, are we are we preparing them? You know, with a with a value system and and with a you know, religious <coughs> life and and other. Uh, life skills to be able to confront certain problems or are we so overwhelmed with hurtling through our days and our lives that these things don't develop into systems and communities tend to be less organized around certain principles or certain values that make it more difficult for individuals to, to make the sort of preparations necessary. Christiana, you want to take that on? Um, you know, here's the image that came up for me when I was uh, listening to your question. In um, the climate change conference in Durban last year, uh, at a critical point in the conversation about w what should we do about adaptation, how do, we, how do we mobilize the world to take this seriously, the minister of Kenya took the microphone and said, she said, here is the most painful thing I have seen with my own eyes. A woman having to climb a tree to give birth because of the floods under her feet. If that doesn't take it to the personal level, okay, that is everything that we talk about on adaptation, everything that we talk about resilience, frankly, for me, is still insufficient until we can get to that level, until we can get precisely to the women and children in developing countries who are by far uncontested the most vulnerable to all of the changes that we are seeing now and can see coming at us. And that's, I mean, that's the span. You can see that we have a huge gap between the things that we're putting in place now, which are anyway insufficient, but how, how do we plan, how do we budget how do we allocate our efforts or thinking toward really making a difference to that level of humanity? That's the challenge. Let me, uh, let me maybe uh, put it more in uh, the narrower U.S. context that I'm familiar with. <clears throat> and let me also, let me put it um, in this context. I think when you start from the economic situation of the American family, uh, it would seem very hard for them to do the kinds of things that you're suggesting they do to prepare themselves. You're, you've got average family incomes down 7% in real terms after inflation over the last 10 years. People don't really have the wherewithal to save. You still have an 8% plus unemployment rate. And so, the, so you start from the economic and say from an economic perspective, the, uh, Americans are simply not in a position, I don't think, uh, to look far ahead and say, where should I be 20 years from now? not in a position to think about what might happen to Medicare or college costs or all that kind of stuff. And I certainly wouldn't profess any expertise on the extent to which that spills over into the more values-oriented aspects of families, but one can imagine that there is a relationship between the two. Well, David, the, the one thing that, uh, that I've been reflecting on as we've carried, as the conversation has gone on, is that in some respects there are, there are really two conversations that we could be having. The, the first is, uh, and Christiana made this point a little a little while ago. We we could think about resiliency in developed markets, and that's sort of three billion of the two or three billion of the people on the world. And there are clear issues of time frame and resilience in those those spaces. Uh, there's uh, there are implications for for others in that in the developed world, and then of course in the developing world. The, the issues of resilience and time frame are very different, as uh, Christiana just said with that, the, the story. Uh, now, we need linkages between the two. Uh, and in fact, Rockefeller is a, is a perfect place to, to think about those, those linkages. But they're, they're in some ways separate challenges. And we need to, we can't really have a conversation exclusively about what's happening in the United States because those questions about families and uh, economics are, are very different than what's happening in Africa or, or South America. But then how do systems, government, financial sector, you know, uh, even non-governmental agencies working in, you know, across first, third world, how do we have 
A, more investment and more organization and shared lessons about this concept of becoming more resilient uh, across the lines. Where are their you know, models, where are their success stories, and then you know, where is there the will to get started? Mike. You, know, you know, David, let me actually raise the question about families. It's actually an interesting question, because <clears throat> I do think a lot of this comes down to the values that you teach your kids. Um, and you know, we've learned all, you know, these lessons abound in all kinds of things you, you, you learn when you go to school. You know, saving for a rainy day. I mean, the story in the Bible about the seven fat years and the seven lean years where they store the grain for the lean years. I mean, these are all, you know, time-tested lessons about recognizing good times can become bad. And, you know, I would say, actually, if you look back at the financial crisis, a lot of the problem there was people who didn't learn that lesson in their financial lives, who, you know, if they get a dollar, they spend it, or they leverage themselves up as, as much as they possibly can. So maybe a lot of the lesson does begin at the gra grassroots level. You've got to teach people, uh, certainly in countries that are used to living, you know, in a very developed way, that there's a certain amount of responsibility and self-reliance at that level, and that means planning for bad things and building um, capabilities so you can fall back on, on something if, if uh, an untoward event ha happens. And then that habit of mind, I think, starts to get translated into the way people make policy, both in terms of their own countries and, and globally. Giving up some of the upside to be yeah. a little bit protected on the downside. Yeah. I mean, one of the things, you know, that I, some of the work that we do is we look at people who deal with supply chain. And it got very fashionable uh, to have just-in-time supply chain. You don't want to have any inventory except literally what you're going to sell that day. And then what people learned is if there's a bad weather event or an earthquake in China uh, or a nuclear disaster in Tokyo, all of a sudden you don't have your supplies and your business is imperiled. So now businesses have learned, because businesses do tend to be responsive, we better have a margin of supply or we better have alternative suppliers and contingency plans. So in many ways, um, all throughout what we do in business and personal lives, um, putting away a little bit of extra fat sometimes pays off. I was just going to say, but remember all these things go in cycles and you have some kind of a terrible experience uh, and you learn a lesson from it and the lesson is learned for a while and then people forget and revert to some other practice and so the analogy to your supply chain thing in the financial world, in the business world, is uh, companies having had a very tough time in 08 and 09 started hoarding cash and as you say giving away a little bit of the ups, uh, upside to protect the downside by just having a lot more financial resources and being uh, and borrowing less and the consequence is they are hiring fewer people and investing less in the near term and so there are a series of trade-offs but I suspect as time goes on that 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 curve will keep moving up and down as as people have different experiences but it, but there are a lot of people in the financial sector who are pushing back against more regulation and more bureaucracy for exactly the reason that they think it's going to um, you know, Im impede their ability to invest and grow. I mean, and, and so maybe it's the particular regulations in place or it's the very concept that some outside actor, in this case government, is going to sort of keep them down and try to mandate this, uh, this quote unquote good behavior, responsible behavior. But I think all of, uh, much of what we're talking about here is about trade-offs. Life is filled with trade-offs and deciding how much you're willing, how much certainty you want to have on one side versus uh, the, the so-called upside. So if you take the banks, their argument is they want less regulation so they can have less capital, so they can make more money by being more leveraged. And the government is quite properly saying no because there's a societal risk to you going crazy and we're going to limit you here. And that's the constant yin and the yang, but it's a yin and the yang we all have in our personal lives. You know, how much life insurance do you carry to protect your kids versus saying, I'm going to live a long time and I've got enough and so forth. That's, that, those are the trade-offs we all have to make in every part of our lives. So, Christian, if we focus on the how, who bears the responsibility for, in, in the developing world, say, uh, for people who could be imperiled by some sort of shock? to become self-reliant, to be able to absorb that shock. Who's got to bear that responsibility? How does it actually get done when some of the very difficulties in the developing world uh, to, in terms of being prepared uh, are there? I, I, I don't think it's, uh, it would be fair or responsible to say, 
this sector, it's the government, it's the private sector, it's, this is a solution that actually has to be crowded in, crowded in, in the sense that everyone needs to assume their own responsibility. Um, children in the Seychelles who are uh, putting up little homemade systems to do water catchment for the rainy days because they need the fresh water. So they're putting in little homemade contraptions to catch water for the rain, for on the rainy days because they know they're heading in for drought. That, that's not a government responsibility. It's not a government action. It's a community response because they understand. And then you go all the way from there to just to show the gamut to international institutions that are now putting in a lot of money into developing drought resistant crops. Um, and governments, of course, putting money into that. So it's, it's the whole gamut. Every single one of us has the responsibility to do what we can, whether it is, you know, whether we live in Washington, whether we live in Malawi, uh, to do what we can to understand that we do have to get into this, into this mode, into this thinking of we need to, on a daily basis, increase our resilience, um, but it cannot be a responsibility of only the children in the school, only the community, only the families, only the business sector, only the financial sector, only government. This is something, it's, it's got to be a new mode of thinking in which we all participate, we all take our responsibility, and we all do as much as we can. As I say, it has to be a crowded in solution. What, what about the reality? I, I referenced the shifting relationship between governments and the governed. But I think this extends to a lack of faith that individuals have in big institutions. What you're talking about, Christiane, is that we're all in this together and we have to find a way to, you know, to crowd this resiliency space. Well, what happens when you have individuals who don't trust their bank anymore? Individuals who, God forbid, don't trust the news media. Uh, <laughs> individuals who don't trust government, who don't heed Secretary Chertoff's warnings. Uh, because they don't trust government to be able to do a good job to, to protect them. Um, how do you deal with that phenomenon when the need for bracing yourself against the unforeseen is so high? Well, in some ways you have that already. Uh, the, the, the trust in finance today and in, in, in business is very, very low uh, in the United States and in sort of the developed world. Uh, Occupy Wall Street is a good manifestation of that, but it's, it's way beyond that. So I think you have uh, two, again, sort of two uh, strands, and actually they're interlinked and they're much more complicated than I'm going to make it, but you have the developed markets and in sort of traditional economies, uh, traditional or, or uh, well, let's just say the, the developed economies and, and markets. There are problems there. We must address them. A lot of it is to do with the short-termism, lack of uh, proper regulation in many respects. But there, there's a long list of things that we need to do in our, in our society, in our markets, uh, politically, et cetera. And then there are significant challenges in the developing world. And there are more people in the developing world. And the challenges are interlinked, whether it be climate change, whether it be health, whether it be water, whether it be poverty. They're all interlinked. And the issues there, of course, is that there's, these challenges are interlinked and they're significant and there's, they're, they're huge. And the amount of money that it will take to address them is, is beyond comprehension in, in many respects. And so there you need to begin to think about other ideas. You need to think about, well, how, do, how does philanthropy uh, address these challenges? How does a business address these challenges? How does uh, government address these challenges? Global governments address these challenges? And are there ways to develop new forms of capital? Are there ways to develop new forms of business, new business models, new approaches to, to thinking about these challenges that may be developed in the developed world? Maybe they didn't, but they are deployed against, against these challenges. So they're, they're linked. We have to get our, our, our act together in the developed world for sure. We need a lot of the tools in the developed world to implement them or to use them in the developing world, but we may need to think about things differently in the developing, developing world as well. We still have a leadership vacuum, Steve. You know, we have threats that we can see on the horizon fiscally, uh, 
that we don't seem to be able to address because government simply can't agree. And by, an ex by extension, the population, which is distrustful of government, can't seem to agree about which approach to take for fear of losing something in the process. So we're talking about the complexities of becoming more resilient when we've got a political system that seems really broken down. Oh, I think that's absolutely true, and I think that that's exactly what we should be worrying about, that we want to be, we want, to, we want a government that's more resilient, and we have one that's becoming less resilient. You know, it's, it's a sad state of affairs that we have a Congress that has a lower approval rating, not only than banks, but of Paris Hilton, and is, is you know, it does, that's true, actually, uh, and, is, um, and is essentially, um, uh, as I said, dysfunctional. And look, my own view, uh, uh, before I get to my own view, one other thing. I was struck this morning uh, by this New York Times poll, which was obviously most about politics, but inside of it, in the midst of this whole anti-government strain, lack of trust in government, lack of belief in government, um, they asked a question, which is not directly on the point of this panel, but I think it's close enough. 56% of Americans think that, we should act, that the government should actually spend more and raise taxes in order to address problems versus 37 who don't. And the same question was asked about whether government should do more to help middle class Americans, and 67% said it should do more. So I think there is somewhere out there in the American people a sense that they know government has to be part of the solution, whether they're willing to exercise their, their right to vote and their ability to influence the political process to achieve that, I don't know, but uh, they do. I think I'd, I'd make one other small observation based on my own time in government, and this is, I guess, the perspective, and probably Mike Chertoff would agree with me, of someone who served in the executive branch, but I think we really uh, I think the balance of power has shifted too far away from the executive branch, that if you look at the sweep of the last 40 years of history, really going back to Vietnam and Watergate, we have systematically been reducing the power that the president and the executive branch has to actually do stuff. And we have been increasing uh, the ability of Congress to not make that happen. I know from my own experience in autos that if we had not had the TARP uh, $700 billion rescue fund, we would not have been able to save the autos. We probably would have been able to save the banks, and I, we would have had some form of an economic Armageddon. And so I understand the risks about excessive power being concentrated in an executive, but we do have elections. And I think if we want a government that's more resilient, if we want a government that's more effective, I think you have to empower the people who are charged with the operating responsibilities to actually do stuff. I actually have a, a I think there's an additional issue which might sound a little counterintuitive. Um, but in addition to the fact that I, I agree the executive branch has um, is the most efficient, has the most energy, and often gets hobbled. But I think actually the bigger problem is Congress itself has, has hobbled itself. If you go back 20 or 30 years, Congress was able to do things because both parties uh, elected leadership uh, that had the capability to bring their caucuses to, into an agreement. So whether it's Republicans or Democrats, uh, people sat down, they figured out what was the resolution that would be the best compromise, if I can use that sometimes not very fashionable word, and then they could deliver a result. Now the problem is everybody is their own leader. So within Congress, you've got 100 senators, each of whom is a leader, and 435 members of Congress, each of whom sees themselves as leaders. That has made it very hard for Congress to act or, or do anything deliberate because in a sense, every new piece of legislation is a new referendum. So I think if I was going to try to do one thing to make the U.S. government more efficient, it would actually be to give Congress uh, more capability and energy to manage itself and its process. And I think that would then make it easier for the executive branch to deal with Congress. So I want to conclude on this area. One of the, one of the best books I've read in the last couple of years was Unbroken. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with it, about uh, former prisoner of war, uh, Louis Zamperini, who, an Olympic runner, who endured great physical and mental hardship, stranded at sea, and then as a prisoner, but was resilient enough to survive it all and to flourish. And what captivates us about that story is we think, could I have done the same thing? And the answer is, not everybody can. Not everybody will. Not every government is as resilient as others. Not every system is as resilient as others. Not every bank is as resilient as another company, so on and so forth. The bottom line is, there are people who can do it and people who can't, systems that can, systems that cannot. Isn't that the reality that we have to confront, as well as the desire to make everybody as resilient as possible, Christian? Well, I 
I think you're totally right that, uh, that there is a disparity and perhaps an unfair distribution of resiliency potential. Uh, but I don't think that that's where the story can end. Um, because the very difficult conundrum that we're in is that those populations that are precisely the ones that have the least resiliency potential today uh, are the most vulnerable, will be the most hit, and have the least responsibility for what is occurring to them. So there is a moral responsibility here that needs to go in and say, okay, Yes, we understand that these populations are the least, uh, the least, of, uh, the least uh, resilient. They are the most vulnerable. What do we do about closing that gap? We are just not living up to that moral responsibility. So we we're are not shying even in the conversation. Away. We're not in the conversation. Not in the conversation about it. Well, I think another question or another uh, assessment of resiliency is to see what what the landscape looks like to see what the challenges are, and then to try to work within those challenges to still affect what you think needs to, to happen. So uh, we've been talking about government, particularly the American government, being, uh, being a challenge. Uh, there's no question that that's true. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we need to stop there. The question is, OK, what can we do? What can civil society do? What can we as individuals do? What can we in business and in finance do to address these challenges? Uh, and the good news is that it's not just the United States. There's lots of places around the world that, that are addressing and thinking about these, these challenges. We've not yet talked about China in this conversation, or Brazil, or India, or, or elsewhere. And we need to then think, well, all right, what is the global context? Where can we make change? How can we accelerate this change, whether it be with climate change or security, or with making markets more resilient and, and better able to address these broader challenges? But you know, it's interesting on that point, just on, uh, in terms of China. I mean, in, in, in that particular space, China seems less concerned as a government with some of the ramifications of, you know, uh, of, of international shocks. Uh, they seem you know, more inclined to sort of stay out of the way of some of these problems. Take Korea, for example. I mean, China has the ability to, to solve the North Korea nuclear challenge in a way that other countries don't, but, but fail to for fear of the economic shock of uh, Koreans coming into their country. Drew? Well, I, I guess I would say that, that, that the Chinese are, uh, and, and I'm certainly not an expert, but my observations would be that that there's public policy and politics within China, and then there's business and, and how they're operating within their ec economic systems. And that's often very different. Right. And, and I would say certainly that the Chinese, <coughs> well, unfortunately, they're not doing as well as they would like to do on the issue of climate change and, and building green businesses. They're well ahead of the United States. And so, and they're ahead of the United States because they get that it's a big deal to their economy, and it's a big deal to their ability to stay in government. So, yes, there's there's a lot of public policy challenges at China that I, I couldn't even begin to comment on. But from a pure business perspective, in some ways, this is my point: is that capital markets and business can operate outside of the context of the global geopolitical um, circumstances. But I think what this, <coughs> what this illustrates is that the, with respect to this whole general area you're talking about, David, there is a free rider issue, that it's easy for a country, an institution, a group of people, whatever, to be free riders. And I know we're not here to talk uh, about China extensively, but I think in a lot of what China does and the way it goes about its business, whether it's emissions and climate change or whether it's foreign policy things, there's a free rider aspect to it. They're, they're totally focused, in my experience with China, on moving that economic ball forward and uh, creating wealth for their people, and that's what their people want, and they're not all that interested, I don't think, in using their resources for the sort of broader good of people outside of their country. But it's just an example of this whole general issue of how you deal with free riders when you're trying to get everybody to contribute, I'm not saying just financially, but in every respect, towards solving some of these problems. Well, let, let me nuance that, because I'm, I'm not sure that I would use the term free riders for um, for China with respect to their energy policy. Um, my sense, and also like uh, David, I'm not an expert, but from what I can observe, is that China has now, for quite a few years, had very aggressive um, energy policy that is taking it toward much, much better uh, renewable energy in their matrix, 
much better energy efficiency, way beyond the United States, of course, um, and that they're beginning to invest very heavily into, yes, they will continue to use coal, but how do they bring down the carbon content and the, the carbon emissions of coal? So they are both from a policy perspective in the 12th year plan, um, in, in the uh, 12th year five uh, year plan that they are now, but also in the 11th previous, they have very clear targets. They are expecting both government and business to deal with that. They missed their uh, carbon intensity and energy intensity target last year. They were very open about it. They said transparently, we missed it and we're going to catch up. And by golly, when China says, I mean, that's one of the, you know, if I may, one of the wonderful things of not having a democracy, when China says, this is my target and I'm going to get there, by golly, not only do they get there, they usually exceed it. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I know Tom Friedman always wistfully says, oh, boy, it's we're not like China. <laughs> I, I absolutely, I could not agree more, um, uh, more violently with that notion. I mean, I think in the long run, the kind of innovation and ingenuity that you need to solve problems does not come from a top-down group that tells everybody you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And I think history has proven it doesn't work. So I'm going to take it to the other end of the spectrum because uh, I still believe, although there's a role for government, obviously, that a lot of the energy on resiliency has to come at, at the micro level, at the individual mm -hmm. and family level. And to me, the, if I could do one thing to promote resiliency, it would be in the educational area. I don't think we educate people with the competency to be resilient. If you look at countries that have, for example, universal military service, like Switzerland or Israel, um, not only do people learn how to be in the army, and uh, Switzerland hasn't had a war in, in centuries, but you learn a, a certain set of skills about planning and life that can be translated into resiliency that makes a big difference when you're facing a natural disaster or, or any kind of a crisis. I'd say even in our own country, in the US, if you go to the West, where people are much more used to living uh, great distances, they have to be much more self-reliant. You find people are more resilient than people who have grown up in, in cities where they think food grows on the, on the shelves Water. of grocery stores. <laughs> so I think if, if we could build into our educational system a little less of feel good about yourself good and a little bit more about how do you take care of yourself, that would actually go a, a real distance in building resiliency. I think it's a good place to end. I think, you know, education, character education, and you think about our young people today, you know, from my children to even the age of your children, who have now grown up and come of age at a time of 9-11 or a financial disaster, they have a better sense that, um, that it's not all, you know, good times. And whether there's also been climate disasters as well, uh, understanding the need both for planning, for heart, and for uh, resilience as they move forward. So uh, hopefully that conversation will continue. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.